Everybody's talking about climate action these days. But green policies are a lot like TikTok. They've done far more harm than people are willing to admit. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Climate change, it's the big baddie that everybody blames whenever something bad happens. Have forest fires run rampant? Blame climate change. Rising crime? Blame climate change. Poverty? Blame climate change. Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman's real killers? Climate change framed OJ. This week marks the UN Climate Summit. Climate activists are staging protests, flooding the streets all across the world, disrupting everyday life, and gluing themselves to things to get their message across. In New York City, where the UN Climate Ambition Summit is underway, many are calling on US President Joe Biden and other global leaders to take action. They want everybody to feel the urgency of the situation because they believe our lives are on the line. Climate activists would have you believe that replacing fossil fuels with 100% renewable energy, among other policies, will fix the environment. Because saving the planet is easy, apparently. Maybe that's why superhero movies are bombing at the box office. The Flash didn't need to go back in time and travel to an alternate dimension. He could have just saved his mom by quitting fossil fuels. But here's the twist. Going green has done a lot more damage to the environment than most people realize. Here are six ways how, starting with number one, producing biofuels. Given how climate action is popular these days, many corporations and the entire sport of Formula One car racing proudly advertise how they're on course to deliver 100% sustainable fuels. They also like to point to the greenhouse gas benefits of corn ethanol. But if a massive reduction in carbon emissions is the goal, biofuels are not the easy answer they appear to be. When you take into consideration things like heavy combustion power harvesting machinery and all the carbon released from tilling soil, it starts to look like ethanol is simply bad for the environment. This is like someone saying they're healthier because they lost 60 pounds by switching to a diet of nothing but cigarettes and meth. According to research funded by the National Wildlife Federation and the US Department of Energy, the carbon intensity of corn ethanol is no less than gasoline and likely at least 24% higher. This is consistent with other studies that find that use of US croplands for biofuels actually increases greenhouse gases. Add to that farm fertilizer runoff that some say fuels algae blooms and animal dead zones, even the Environmental Protection Agency recognizes this drawback, yet ethanol use still persists to this day because of the mistaken belief that it's always greener no matter the circumstances. So ethanol is like Jared Leto. Everyone thinks he's super environmentally friendly, but he's actually pretty toxic and potentially a danger to young people. Now, if biofuels are actually bad for the environment, you might think that a better answer would be to use electric vehicles. But this leads us to number two producing toxic electric vehicles. One of the main selling points of fully electric vehicles is that they don't run on fossil fuels. Many see electric vehicles as the go-to solution for climate change, which is why places like California want to accelerate to 100% new zero emission vehicle sales as soon as possible. But it turns out producing electric vehicles is absolutely horrible for the environment. Electric vehicles require lithium ion batteries to function, they're made from rare earth materials like lithium and cobalt, which require heavy machinery to mine. Either that or good old child labor in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which supplies 70% of the world's cobalt. But I'm sure those kids don't mind. They're saving the environment. They'll appreciate that if they grow up. It also requires a lot more energy to produce electric vehicle batteries compared to regular car batteries. Where does that energy come from? Well, since China now dominates the EV industry, chances are China's gazillion coal power plants are fueling this. Don't worry, China made a pinky promise to stop using coal. Someday. And I'm sure they wouldn't lie. Committing genocide is one thing, but lying? They don't want to look like jerks. Lithium mining is also very water intensive. Producing just one ton of lithium can take up to 500,000 gallons of water. The mining process risks contaminating groundwater, which led Tibetans to protest a local Chinese lithium mine when fish started turning up dead. And there's a lot of debate over how much lithium mining affects water scarcity, especially in the Lithium Triangle in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, where more than half of the Earth's currently known lithium supply is found. 
The production process isn't the only thing that's potentially toxic. Since they're too difficult and expensive to recycle, used lithium ion batteries end up in landfills, where they not only emit toxic fumes, but even explode. That's extra smoke that the environment could really do without. This happens a lot more frequently than you realize. And here I thought Jared Leto was going to be the most toxic thing I discussed today. The US Environmental Protection Agency found that 64 waste facilities experienced 245 fires caused by, or likely caused by, lithium metal or lithium ion batteries between 2013 and 2020. We could also end up seeing a lot more cases of lithium explosions thanks to China, since it makes tons of cheap, shoddy electric vehicles, like this one. I've called a lot of things on this show figurative dumpster fires, but lithium batteries are causing literal dumpster fires. X ain't got nothing on that. And there's more after the break. Welcome back. Despite all the flaws I mentioned earlier, many still have a rosy view of electric vehicles' role in protecting the environment. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology argues that while EVs are none too environmentally friendly to manufacture, they are so much more environmentally friendly to drive that they still win over the lifetime of the car, even if you take into account the not-so-clean sources of electricity. And according to the New York Times, the good news for electric vehicles is that most countries are now pushing to clean up their electric grids. In the United States, utilities have retired hundreds of coal plants over the last decade and shifted to a mix of lower emission natural gas, wind, and solar power. As a result, electric vehicles have generally gotten cleaner too. But there's a problem with this. Which leads us to number three, producing solar and wind energy. Passing solar and wind energy initiatives doesn't necessarily guarantee a cleaner environment. Our first hint should have been knowing that passing wind never makes anything less messy. According to Environmental Protection, one of the major environmental issues with solar panels is their production process. Solar cells and other components require large amounts of energy and water during the manufacturing process, making them resource intensive. And where are most solar panels made? You guessed it, China. It accounts for around 80% of the world's supply of solar-grade polysilicon and over 97% of the world's solar wafers, both of which are necessary for making solar panels. These are guaranteed to be manufactured using energy from Chinese coal plants, which they super promise to stop using someday. Yeah, they use rape as a form of torture, but they definitely wouldn't also be liars. Now, just like with electric vehicles, many say that solar panels will help offset the initial environmental costs over their lifetime. But when you take Chinese coal plants into consideration, the amount of carbon emissions prevented by solar panels may be a lot less than we realize. It took a lone Italian researcher to realize that solar panels were at least three times more carbon intensive than what the leading authorities claimed. People grossly underestimated the amount of carbon required for solar panel production because they weren't taking data from China into account. Also, just like with lithium ion battery waste, solar panel waste is a problem. Solar cells contain hazardous materials like lead and arsenic that must be disposed of properly when the panels are no longer in use. But it's much cheaper to just throw solar panels away into landfills than to recycle them. Because folks are willing to spend thousands of dollars on solar panels to help the environment, but ask them to recycle them, and they're like, recycle? Forget that, those coral reefs can fend for themselves. According to 2016 projections by the International Renewable Energy Agency, or IRENA, the world may have 78 million tons of solar panel waste by 2050. But taking into account how people usually buy new solar panels before their old ones expire, the Harvard Business Review predicts that solar panels could produce 50 times more waste in just four years than what IRENA anticipated. I haven't seen such a big pile of sun-related trash since sunshine. I'd rather stare at the actual sun for 107 minutes. Windmills also have a waste problem, especially the turbine blades, since they're too difficult and expensive to break down. One study conducted by Cambridge University predicts that the world will have 43 million tons of wind blade waste in landfills by 2050. Guess who contributes the most to wind blade waste? And no, it's not Mega Man from all the times he defeated Air Man. Yep, it's China, again. Are we sure China is an actual country and not the final boss of Captain Planet villains? Now, there are technological breakthroughs that are trying to make recycling more practical and affordable. But even if we perfect the waste management side of things, there's the question of how to meet energy demand. And that leads us to number four, transitioning the electric power grid. 
In order to function, power grids require enough supply to match demand. Coal, natural gas, and nuclear plants can adjust their output accordingly, but not solar and wind. You also can't rely on solar and wind to be consistent since they heavily rely on their being sun and wind, and the battery technology to store solar and wind energy is still not there yet. That hasn't stopped places like California and Hawaii from aggressively pushing to make their electric grid completely dependent on renewable energy within the next few decades, without much realistic planning. Companies try to prioritize compliance with green mandates, but in doing so, they neglect safety. This, in turn, has led to some of the most disastrous fires we've seen, like the recent Maui wildfire and the 2018 California campfire. And you might not believe this, but according to one study, fire bad. That study was published by Dr. Frankenstein's monster. And he would know, he's literally green. People's short-term focus on reaching green mandates may have ended up leaving behind toxic devastation in the air and water that could last for years. I have more to say on the topic of the electric grid, but let me first tell you one other thing first, right after this final commercial break. Welcome back. Since we're on the topic of fire, let's look at number five, preventing deforestation. As we've seen from recent events, forest fires are getting worse. Many believe that they're growing in frequency thanks to deforestation, climate change, and the biggest menace to the human species, gender reveal parties. But by the numbers, wildfires have actually been decreasing over the past 30 years. While they are fewer in frequency, they're getting larger, largely because more and more people are moving to areas where there's a higher risk of wildfires, especially in the western half of the US. Humans cause nearly 90% of wildfires in the United States via discarded cigarettes, unattended campfires, burning debris, or through equipment malfunctions. Green policies are also to blame. Legislation to protect and preserve forests and wild spaces, such as limiting logging, have left too much forest growth. Essentially, there was more to burn. It's kind of like how if guys don't get their hair cut often enough, there's a much higher risk for man buns breaking out. Smokey the Bear should also warn barbers that only you can prevent man buns. According to the Western Governors Association, over time, the fire-prone forests that were not thinned burned in uncharacteristically destructive wildfires. This means that carefully managing forests is key. In the long term, leaving forests overgrown and prone to unnaturally destructive wildfires means there will be significantly less biomass on the ground and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The U.S. Department of Agriculture also came to similar conclusions as well. That's why it's important to log and burn forests in a controlled manner rather than completely restricting human activity or access in the name of saving the environment. It's like how Bob Barker used to always tell us to spay and neuter our pets. It's because it helps to keep the pet population from overgrowing and becoming a problem. Now say that the U.S. improves its environmental management practices and power grid safety standards. Can green energy policies finally be more viable for the environment? Well, you've got to take into consideration number six, offshoring dirty energy production to other countries. Despite what climate activists would have you believe, green energy isn't sufficient to meet current demand, at least with current technology now. Even pro-climate action officials are aware that they can't fully give up fossil fuels right away. They ask themselves every night, why can't I quit you? And yet they try to appease climate activists by closing down fossil fuel production whenever it's convenient for them to do so. That's what the Biden administration has been doing ever since it campaigned on taking action to tackle climate change. Biden has barred certain oil drilling projects and told power plants to cut climate pollution by 90% between 2035 and 2040 or face shutdowns. But moves like that throttle U.S. energy production. In order to make up for it, Biden has looked to authoritarian oil-producing regimes like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. If you're really concerned about fossil fuel use, making other countries do it for you isn't exactly going to reduce it. In fact, you're likely making climate change even worse since a lot of countries have worse environmental protection regulations and technology than the U.S., not to mention human rights protections. One example of this is the U.S.'s record on gas flaring, the burning of excess natural gas to depressurize equipment in oil refineries. According to the World Bank's 2022 Global Gas Flaring Tracker Report, out of all the top 10 flaring countries based on volume over the past decade, only the U.S. successfully improved the flaring intensity of its oil production. Meanwhile, Venezuela was among the worst performers, 
flaring more gas per barrel of oil produced than any other country. But out of sight, out of mind, right? And Biden seems to be good at keeping things out of mind. If the U.S. really cares about climate change and energy security, then it should be realistic about the pitfalls of going green. On top of building the proper infrastructure and tech, it should be relying less on countries like China and Venezuela for energy by building and producing for itself and others. It's the cleaner and safer alternative for tackling climate change and holding it responsible for killing Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Do you want to make a positive impact for the environment? Then consider helping America Uncovered with voluntary contributions on patreon.com slash America Uncovered. We don't burn money, so you can count on us when you give us the fuel we need to keep operating. Just click that orange button. Now, if you want to learn more in depth about how California screwed up its green energy goals, then click on this video. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.